Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation, chapter Revelation chapter 2. So before we get started, um, let me just say this. I want to thank the Lord publicly. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, those of you that were here last week. Man, last week I was not feeling well. Uh, and yeah, I was feeling like, like not good. Um, but, um, but it's good to give praise and give, give, give glory. I thanked him last week for all the days that I feel good, even though I didn't feel good. So it's important that I tell you, man, I feel great today. Amen. Amen. And we say, say, thank you, Lord, Amen. for all those good days that you give us, Lord. Amen. Amen. So in a, for, for a second here, or between you and the Lord, good for you to, you know, focus in on that too and just give him thanks for, in fact, it is a gift that we feel good. And we roll the way that we roll. So thank you, Lord, for just the, the gift of feeling great. So with that said, um, I want to remind you also, guys. <coughs> excuse me. I want to remind you to please keep uh, little Adrian in prayer. Um, and if you're here on Wednesday nights, you know that we have a, a list that we go through every Wednesday. Um, but... Some of you aren't here, so I need to remind you. Listen, and the reason for that is, is because um, you remember a, a while back, we dedicated Adrian to the Lord. Say amen if you're with me. And part of that process is that we, as a church, continue to pray for Adrian. We pray for his physical health. Most of all, we pray for his spiritual health. We pray for his what health? Spiritual health, because that's what we want. We want a young man who grows up and is not like... Most of them in here that had to go through the struggles and, and, and pitfalls before coming to know Christ and before having victory. Um, so we want them to catch it from the beginning. We also um, uh, committed ourselves to praying for mom. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass her, but, you know, the parents of these kids, in this case Adrian, um, they need prayer too because she stood before us and made a declaration and made a commitment and said, I'm going to raise up this kid in the ways of the Lord. Amen? Amen. But being that she, he, me, because we did that same with him, being that we're just imperfect beings, we need prayer. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. So we've committed to that, so I want to remind you of that. Um, not to mention that um, it is our responsibility, and this is why I want to, this is why I, I so rejoice in small churches, that we would be praying for each other, and I know that we are. But just keep it up, for we all need prayer. Our kids need prayer. The little ones, the medium-sized ones, and the older ones. How do we know that? Because I'm a grown man and I need prayer. How much more our kids need prayers, right? Amen? So I just want to remind you of that mindset and that thread that we want to have as a people who belong to God. We're not just doing life. We're doing life according to His terms. We're doing life in and within His kingdom. Say amen if you're with me. So I shoot that at you so you would remember. So you would not forget. Um, so please do that. And with that said, please join me as we, as we indeed pray for Adrian, um, Jessica, and all our kids. Join me, please. Lord, we, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the privilege, the responsibility that we have to pray. Um, Lord, as we continue to dig in and grow with you, we understand that things are much deeper. They're much wider. They're much heavier than what we see um, with the naked eye, Lord. Um, so we, we come, Lord, and we do battle, as your word says, to, for us to do battle. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle. We don't fight. We don't battle with that which, against that which we see. We battle against those things that we cannot see principalities, powers of darkness, um, powers in hidden places, as your word says in the book of Ephesians. So we come, Lord, and we pray. 
And we pray for Adrian, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that um, he would continue to grow big and strong, Lord, not just physically, but most of all spiritually, Lord. We pray for Jessica, Lord, that she would, Father, indeed, continue to grow, make the responsibility, the, 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 the practice, have the mindset, Lord, that he's only going to go as far as she goes, Lord. So we pray for her, Lord. We pray for the rest of our children, Daddy. Um, we pray, Lord, as we always pray, that they would know you, Lord. That they would develop a strong relationship with you, Lord. That they would know who they are in you, Lord. Loved. Forgiven. Accepted. Brought in, Lord. Sealed, Lord. So we pray for them, Lord. The young ones. The middle ones, Lord, the older ones, we pray for all of them, Lord. And we pray for us as parents, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, discernment, godly understanding on how to go about business with our kids, Lord. For we understand, Lord, that they are a gift from you. We understand that they are lent to us by you, Lord. You could have picked any parents to father, to mother those children, but you've picked us, Lord. So we want to take that responsibility, Lord, seriously. So help us, Lord to do that which we need to do, Lord, in you and for you, Lord, that we would point to you, Lord. For I can't give $20 if I only have five in my pocket, Lord. So I pray for us, Lord, that we would take our rightful place in drawing close to you, Lord, so that we would be able to give out, Lord, that which is in us, even as we studied on Wednesdays. For out of us will flow rivers of living water. And that's what we want, Lord. So thank you again, Lord, for the opportunity, for the privilege, for the responsibility that you place upon us to pray, to be focused on something more than that which is temporal, but to fix our eyes on that which is eternal, Lord. Even as you told the woman at the well, if you knew the one that was talking to you. And so we know who we belong to, Lord. So thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said... Amen. Amen. And hey, family, one more thing. Um, um, we want to celebrate somebody's birthday who is tomorrow's birthday. But we want to bring him up and embarrass him big time. Come on, bro. Get up here. Get up here, Tony. No, she did. Oh, she did. Why do you think I'm dressed this way, bro? Come here. Ernie Padron looks at me this morning and says, you're either going to a funeral or to a wedding. And I'm like, no, it's somebody's birthday. Come here, bro. Yeah, Bob, but you don't get away with it here, bro. This is, a, this is an equal embarrassment opportunity place, bro. So, no, but this is the best one, though. Amen, bro. That's a fact. That's a fact. Anyway, so we want to pray for my brother here. Um, thanking the Lord that he's given him the years that he's given him. We understand that um, it's a gift. We also understand what the book of Psalms says. The book of Psalm. The book of what? Psalms. Chapter 90. Moses, as he writes the book of Psalm, he says, Lord, give me a heart of wisdom. Teach me to, give me a heart of wisdom that I would know how to number my days. In other words, he understood that there's one thing that's not negotiable, and that's the time that we have on earth. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. That's non-negotiable. God has set it up in the manner that there is a time that's appointed for us to die, and that's it. I'm not getting one more minute than what has already been allotted to me. And so we need to guard those minutes. And so our prayer for him, which is going to be in a second, is that he would gain a heart of wisdom. He needs it, I need it, you need it. That we would know how to number our days and that we would understand the totality, the weight, the depth of this which we have been entrusted with, life here on this earth. Amen? Amen. So let's pray for him. My bro, we rejoice. In your birthday, my bro, I rejoice that I'm a part of it. Um, you know, we've been together for many years. I know. <laughs> when are you going to leave? No, just kidding. <laughs> I couldn't let that one go, bro. Um, no, I appreciate you, bro. And, um, and so let's pray. How about we sing happy birthday? Yes, that's what it's all about. Ready? Happy birthday to you, Tony. Happy birthday to you, Tony. Happy birthday, dear Tony. Happy
happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, so, you want to say anything? Hey, that's a no-no. I'm too old for that. You want to say something? No, no, we're good. I appreciate everything you guys have done for me, and uh, I thank the Lord that I'm still alive. Hallelujah. And uh, I thank you for uh, being with our name for all these years. I married them. <laughs> Right? That's awesome, bro. What a joy. Okay, thank you. Amen. Amen indeed, bro. Amen indeed. Let's pray. Let's pray. So, Daddy, again, we thank you for this day, Lord, and um, we appreciate relationships, Lord. First and foremost, our relationship that you, gave, that you have allowed us to have with you, which then allows us to have a relationship with each other, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for those long-standing relationships that you have set up before time began, Lord. Um, that are being manifested and, and seen today with our eyes, Lord. And one of them is Tony, Lord, and Arlene, and, and the joy of being able to do life, Lord. We've, we've shed tears. We've shed disappointments together. We have, um, we have experienced disgust together. Um, but, Lord, we've also experienced joy and you together, Lord, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, we pray for Tony. We pray that you would give him a heart of wisdom, Lord, that he would know, that you would teach him to number his days, Lord, that he would make his time fruitful, Lord, that he would be relevant and a, a factor when it comes to your kingdom, Lord, in whatever responsibility in life that you have entrusted to him. So that's our prayer for him, Lord. And again, we thank you, Lord, that we belong to you. We thank you for this, this gathering called Living Upward, Lord. Um, we just rejoice, Lord, in the opportunity to do life together and church together and get to know you together, Lord. No agendas, Lord. No, uh, Lord, you. That's it. You as the center of it all. Thank you for that, Lord, and thank you for Tony's birthday, Lord. Uh, give him many, many, many more, Lord, serving you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen. Thank you, my bro. Love you, man. God bless you, bro. So, you're there in Revelation chapter 2, I pray. Let's go ahead. Let's read. Are you hearing me? Okay. So, chapter 2, let's pick up in verse 18. Let's go ahead and let's read together. Here we go. So, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Can you say Thyatira? Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and feet like fine brass. I know your works. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and hey, she did not repent. Verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into, a, into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, verse 24, Revelation chapter 2, as many as do not have this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine of Jezebel, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. I'm going to read that again, verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He, verse 27, shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Your attention, please. Um, heavy stuff today, as always the book of Revelation is, as God's words always is. A um, couple things. 
I want to make sure that we understand where we're at. You remember uh, the author of this book, John, Pastor John, Brother John, elderly, elderly man at this point. Because of his belief in Christ, he has been outcast. He has been thrown in to, to an island called Patmos. He's imprisoned there. And there, Jesus appears to him and tells him to write some things down. The outline for the book, it's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, where Jesus tells him, Hey, John, write the things which you have seen. Write the things which are. And then write the things which will take place after this. Say amen if you're with me. So the things that are, I mean, the things that you're seeing, well, what he's seeing right there on the spot. The things which are the church age, chapters 2 and 3. And then the things which will take place after this. After what? After the church age. Say amen if you're with me. Amen? Right? So this is what he tells him. So here we are in the midst of the church age. How do we know? Because here we are at church. The Lord hasn't come back to get His people. The tribulation period hasn't begun. How do we know? <laughs> I'm still, I can still go to the supermarket and buy food. Right? Say amen. So, here we are in the midst of the church age. So the letter here is written to the pastor, to the angel of the church at Thyatira. Now, important for me to remind you of this. I was going back and forth and thinking that I had given you wrong information in the past, but I normally don't write down notes, so I can't go back and, and see. And I, here I have a very short outline because there's some information that I always want to write down because I don't want you to miss out on it. And sometimes I forget the information. Um, so I couldn't remind, remember if I gave you this or not, but just in case, I want to remind you that, and it's important for me to let you know that these last four churches that we're going to deal with, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea, listen, these church systems are still around today. They're still around today. So the last four churches that we're going to deal with, starting today, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, that, though, that system, if you will, is still around today. How do we know? Well, look at verse 29 with me. I'm sorry, look at verse 25. Listen to what verse 25 says. But hold fast what you have till I come. Did you see that? No, but really, did you see that? Okay, good, because only like three of you answered. <laughs> hold fast till I come. He tells them, stay strong until I come. Speaking of his second coming. Speaking of his taking us out of here. So my point is that it's... Th we can very clearly say, hey, the, these systems are still around today. Now, let me give you what many believe, okay? So, many believe that the church of Thyatira, although many of their characteristics can be in Sardis and can be in Philadelphia and can be in Laodicea, these characteristics can be shared Okay, they're, 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 the way that they handle business can be shared. But for the most part, these are the very clear delineations, if you will. Thyatira, many believe that it's the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. Is it still around today? Yes. Say amen if you're with me. Is it still around today? Indeed it is. Sardis, as we dig in and we find out about them, we can very, very clearly say, man, that's the Protestant Church. That came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And then we have the Church of Philadelphia, which is the evangelical church of the last two centuries. So this, Sardis, came out of Thyatira. Philadelphia came and started sending missionaries out, sharing the gospel. And then many believe that Laodicea, as we dig in and we find out about them and read about them, that it clearly refers to the liberal church that started way back, but that exists now today. Say amen if you're with me, family. Amen. Do you need to know this for your salvation? Of course not. At the end of the day, this, it doesn't matter. 
but for the sake of us staying with some type of very, um, with, with the way that we do business here, the way that we teach the word here, the way that, that you're expected to learn here, then I need to give you this so that we are very clear on where we're at. You know that we have a very, very scholarly um, atmosphere here. And so this is important that you understand this. And even if you forget it, big whoop. Has no bearing on our salvation, but I needed to let you know as we dig in. So, you got your Bibles here. Let's get going. Remember, the book of Ephesus, um, they had left their first love. God says, God's complained about them. Hey, you left your first love. Um, they were the, the apostolic church. His, his exhortation, come back to me. Amen? Then we dig into this, to the uh, church of Pergamos. They were known as the persecuted church. You remember that they were, man, squeezed and decimated almost. Smyrna. I'm sorry, Smyrna. I apologize. Smyrna. Thank you, family. Smyrna. They were, um, man, they were just decimated, but yet they grew big and strong. The persecuted church. Then we jump into Pergamos, which um, God referred to as the compromising church. They began to compromise some things. They were getting a little slack in how they, they dealt with, with certain things. And so here we jump into Thyatira. And as we jump into Thyatira, let me tell you what was going on. The church had a lot of love, but they were letting go of truth. They had a lot of love, but they were getting, letting go of truth. And so let me submit to you that you can't have love without truth. You can have what seems to be love, but true love will always be based on the foundation of truth. Say amen if you're with me, family. That's why in the book of John, we went over it this Wednesday, Jesus told the woman, hey, the Lord now is seeking those who are going to seek Him in spirit and in truth. And so this church at Thyatira, they had a lot of love, but they were letting go of the truth. They were flirting with false teachers. They were flirting with false doctrines. They were allowing things to come into the church that God was like, hey, I don't want that. And listen, this is important for us to grasp at the end of the day. The enemy, Satan, he is always going to try to get us to be unfaithful to God. See, he already lost the battle for our salvation. That's a done deal. You've been sealed. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased with the blood of Christ. Nothing can take you away from that. You did nothing to earn it, so you can't do anything to, listen, lose it. That's a done deal. But what is, what is negotiable now is our walk. And so Satan does anything and everything to try to get us to be unfaithful to God. Matter of fact, that's what he does with our children. He tries to distract them so that their focus is not God, but everything else. Heck, that's what he does with us, doesn't he? How often has he done that with us? How often have we fallen into that distracted mode? Haven't lost my salvation. Not, any loved, not loved any less by the Lord, but man, I'm just distracted. And so this is what was happening. And let me tell you, God does not like idolatry. God does not like when we shift our attention and make, put something else, sit something else on the throne that He belongs on. Say amen if you're with me, family. Very important for us to grasp that. Okay, for us to understand that. It was in September 11th, 2001, specifically, that, well, you know what transpired. The Twin Towers, um, they were, well, we were attacked on our soil. You know the deal. You know that church attendance grew by 85% in the subsequent four months after September 11th attack. Matter of fact, Darius and I uh, were going to a church, and I was uh, one of the pastors on staff there, and, uh, man, that church, <laughs> that Wednesday after when it happened, um, or even that Sunday, I believe, man, that, I, I, we, there was nowhere to sit because everybody came to church. 
Because that's what draws people to church. Calamity, um, struggles, uh, pitfalls, right? Nothing wrong with that. Praise God. God will use that sometimes for us to shoot towards Him. I think it was literally about five months after that that everything just started to die down again. And what, what was the cause of that? What was the cause of people coming to church and then stepping away as a whole, as a whole? Because obviously a lot of people stayed. Amen, right? God, you know, God touched a lot of people, but a lot of people still, yeah, that was it. I'm not worried anymore. I'm not concerned anymore. I'm not scared anymore. It's all good, right? Um, by the way, this is part of the tribulation period that we're going to read about starting in chapters 4 on. Part of what's coming onto the earth is so that people would in fact turn to Him. Right? So, God is much more interested in your um, eternal state than in your physical state. Doesn't mean He doesn't care about you right now. Doesn't mean He doesn't provide for you right now. Doesn't mean that you're not going to live a victorious life right now. Despite the little pitfalls and speed bumps that we got to cross and hurdles that we got to jump over. Um, and some of them, some of the hurdles that we go under. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you can jump the hurdle. No, bro, I'm just going to go under, man. <laughs> but we still get through, amen? Because there he is. Sometimes he sh shoots us over. Sometimes he gives us a kick from behind to get under. It doesn't matter. He's going to get us through. Because that's who he is. He's a good, good father. Amen, indeed. So, um, so what was the reason that all these people, man, um, just, that's it. And was it lack of prayer? Was it lack of time in the Word? Here's what it is. And here's the bottom line. God, we have placed something else on the throne that belongs to God. That's what happened. People moved away from putting God first and they put, well, fill in the blank. Whatever, you know what it is. I can list, give you a list of 10 things right now that I can very clearly, if I'm not watching myself, put before God and... There is something else sitting on the throne instead, that, instead of him sitting on the throne, right? And so, that's what's called idolatry in the Bible. And let me tell you, God hates idolatry. God shares his glory, the Bible says, with no one. Let me tell you the three things that belong to God. You know, you've heard them a hundred times, right? He says, my glory I share with no one. That belongs to God. Let me tell you the other thing that belongs to God. The tithes belong to God. He says it very clearly. The tithes belong to me. The third thing that belongs to God is vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Now I know that we try to take vengeance, but God is very clear on the three things that belong to Him. And so He shares His glory with no one, and He hates idolatry. He's not going to strike you down. How do I know that? Because I'm still standing. If somebody should have been struck down a long time ago, it should have been me. He's not going to strike you down because he already struck his son down on the cross 2,000 years ago. He paid the price for you and me. He paid the price for your slackness. He paid the price for your sin. He paid the price for your complacency. He paid the price. But listen, very important. I need you to understand this before we move on. You've heard it before. I need you to hear it again. There are consequences to our actions. There could be a good consequence or there could be a bad consequence, but make no mistake about it, there's going to be a consequence. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Very important that we understand that concept. God, in His sovereignty, has set up a system in this world. And it's called, you should know this by now, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. That is His, this is the way that He functions on earth. I can't get an apple tree unless an apple seed has been planted. Say amen if you're with me. He created it all, and then He created the system of seed time and harvest. And that flows all the way through every aspect of our lives. We're going to get into that in a second. <coughs> so you got your Bibles there? Let's pick up in verse 18. He says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, Right, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Real quickly, just so that we're clear, 
this eye is like a flame of fire, it means that nothing is hidden from his sight. Amen? He sees it all. Those eyes pierce the best facade that we can put on. Those eyes pierce the best disguise, the best pretensions. Those eyes go straight to the heart of who you really are, despite what people see, good and bad. The feet like fine brass, just so you know, brass is always a sign of judgment in the Bible. It's a symbol for judgment in the Bible. So he says, I see everything and I judge correctly. Say amen if you're with me, family. Okay? He doesn't judge like you and I judge based on what I see, what I don't see. Uh, if you were nice to me today or if you weren't nice to me today, if you called me back or if you didn't call me back. No, you and I judge that way. Trying to grow in that area, by the way. He doesn't judge that way. He judges in truth. He knows what's up. So he's letting them know, hey, Thyatira, listen, this is who's dealing with you. Understand the depth and the, and the weight of this and who's speaking to you. Look at verse 19. I know your works. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. I love that. We have a church where people loved and served. They had faith. They persevered with their patience. They were doing great. Even to the point that, even to the point that their works, they, they, were, they were growing in works. Isn't it the case that we normally get leaner with our works? Right? Would you agree with that? Sometimes we start super strong and then <laughs> fizzle out. Right? Can't get enough of coming, then all of a sudden, not here anymore. Can't get, whoosh. he says, this guys, these people, man, you're doing even more than you used to do. Amazing. But despite all those good works, listen, the eyes of flames and those feet of, of brass, they're identifying something much greater. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this, have a few things against you. I remind you of God's pattern, praise, correction, and then motivation with eternity in mind. Because, he says, you have allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Notice she calls herself a prophetess. Does God call her a prophetess? No. Does, uh, no, no, she. She calls herself a prophetess. You have allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants. Circle, underline that word seduce because it's a very strong one. We, I don't want to gloss over that. She's not, she's seducing them. That, that has a very demonic implication. You have allowed that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So a couple things I want to point out. Who is this lady Jezebel that he's talking about? Because we read that there's this woman here at the church at Thyatira who was a leader, who was a teacher. Jezebel wasn't her name. But you know that Jesus, he will name people according to their character. You remember that from last week? Or maybe the week before that? Remember me? What was it? Uh, Bulletproof vest. Remember that? That was a joke. Actually, I'm speaking things. It was really a, it's not really a joke. No, it's not, because that's who I want to be in Him. I want to be a bulletproof vest. Right? I want to be He who doesn't get rankled by people's opinions. I want to be he who doesn't get rankled because, uh, um, you know, because of situations. I want to be steadfast and immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I want to be steadfast and immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's it. That's who I want to be. 
period. And so you know that the Bible says, and he dealt with Pergamos like that, he said, I'm going to give you a name that nobody's going to know because I know you. You remember that from last time? And so here he's calling that lady, hey, that lady Jezebel, it wasn't really Jezebel. He was just calling her according to her character. And so he chooses this name to refer to this lady at Thyatira who was teaching. So who is the real Jezebel? It's important that I let you know so that you would understand why God is calling this lady Jezebel, this lady at Thyatira, Jezebel. Who was this lady Jezebel? Well, listen, the story is found in the book of 1 Kings chapter 16. You don't need to turn there, but for you note takers, write it down, man, because you want to read it. 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. This is where we find the story of this lady Jezebel. Let me tell you who she was. She was married to the king of the northern tribes, the king of Israel. His name was Ahab. What was the king's name? Ahab. You can call him Ahab if you want, right? Some say tomatoes, some say tomatoes, right? So she was married to this guy, King Ahab. King Ahab, unfortunately, for whatever reason, he wasn't too much of a leader, despite the fact that he was king. Jezebel, a rotten woman, and I can call her that because God called her that, well, she, she was horrible, man. She murdered, she manipulated, or better yet, I should say, she manipulated, she murdered, All in order to gain power and to gain land. Say amen if you're with me. Jezebel. Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Very bad. That's not my opinion. That's not your opinion. That's what God has said. So this woman Jezebel, despite that there was a male in the picture and he was king, she was the head honcho. Get out of the way, Ahab. I'm running the country. Matter of fact, Go cook me some eggs and bacon. <laughs> yes, dear. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Well, no, no. Wrong. Nothing wrong with cooking eggs and bacon. Wrong in God had raised up Ahab, not Jezebel. Jezebel manipulated, cheated, murdered, all to gain land and power. Listen, she seduced. There's that word. She seduced the nation of Israel. To worship, into worshiping false gods, specifically the god called Baal, B-A-A-L. Specifically that one. Because this god was supposed to, super big time lie, cause people to be fertile. This god was supposed, this god, lowercase g, was supposed to cause the land to be fertile. And the way that you got this god to do this was, listen, ready? Here we go. Sacrificing children. Sexual orgies in the temples that they, would, that they had. These kind of things stirred this God Baal to provide. Somehow the nation of Israel had forgotten that it is God who gives us rain for our crops. Somehow, these people had been duped into believing a lie. And Jezebel was the one behind it. And now here at Thyatira, there is a lady doing the same thing. Being an immoral and ungodly influence. And the church was not only allowing it, but listen, following her. Here's where I'm going to get in trouble. Ready? Here's where I'm going to get in trouble. Should a woman be a pastor? So, the answer, according to the scriptures, is a resounding no. Please, ladies. It doesn't mean that the women are any less than a man. 
As a matter of fact, we went through it on Wednesday. Listen, God chose the Samaritan woman to go preach the gospel and have all of Samaria get saved. God chose Mary to come to the um, tomb and to speak to her and tell her, go back and tell the apostles. God holds ladies up here. Man and woman are equal when it comes to God. As a matter of fact, as they intertwine, they, as they become one, they exhibit the totality of Jesus. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Say amen if you're with me. I know that it's not because we're such sinful individuals and we're still growing and learning and maturing. But you are supposed to see Doris and Edward Abraham together and all of Doris's gifts and all of the things that she has that I don't have. And you, there's very few things that I have that she doesn't have, but there's a couple here and there. She's got much more than me. And as we do life together, then you look and you say, well, there's Jesus. Are you getting the symbolic yes. picture, family? Yes? Right? Okay, so, so I needed to share that with you. Because I don't want anyone calling me and saying, I'm leaving the church. Because, don't you know? Listen, come on, man. We can still do church together, can we? We can agree to disagree, right? But I ask you, read the Bible. It wasn't but many years ago, and I don't know if she'll remember, but um, Maite Padron, that many years ago she asked me, I don't know if she remembers this, she said to me, should women be pastors? And I said to her, give me your email. She gave me her email. And I sat down and I wrote out this big old thesis, <laughs> which could have got an A, by the way, um, explaining exactly what the scriptures say. So, I throw that at you. Not Edward Abraham's opinion, but what the scriptures say. Take it for what you want. That's not the point of today. Please say amen if you're with me. Amen. And thank you for not getting up and walking away. Right? But certainly you're free to do so. We love you. No matter what. So, this lady here, apparently, is being allowed to get up and to lead this flock. Wrong already, but in the process, she's shifting people's attention away from Jesus Christ and Him crucified and putting it on other things. If you see that happening here at any point in time, not from a woman's teaching, because that's not happening. The Bible says women teach women. And as a matter of fact, older women teach the younger women, right? Not older in necessarily age, but older in walking with the Lord, older in wisdom. So let me throw this at you. Woman here today, and I say that respectfully. <laughs> I only call my, li my wife like that sometimes. Woman, get in there and cook me something. <laughs> oh, it happens, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Those words come out, but it doesn't happen. But it's all good. We got a good agreement. So, women here, to, women here today, what are you doing? Are you one of those that are older in the Lord, been walking with the Lord for a long time? Are you teaching the younger women? I say that in love. I don't know if you are. I don't know if you're not. I'm just letting you know that's what your responsibility is. To teach the younger women, not just with word, but in deed, D-E-E-D, -E -E in your actions. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Perfection, not even close. Progression, but definitely, man, this is how we roll. That's what the word says. So, what I was saying to you before, if you ever see anything happening here that we're not pointing to Jesus Christ, I always tell you the same thing, and I'm going to tell you again today, run. Run. Leave here. Don't stay here. If you ever see that somehow this guy starts to
quack out and stops teaching about Jesus Christ. Run. Say amen if you're with me. I'm dead serious. Run. So, here we got this woman teaching, being an immoral influence, an ungodly influence, and again, the church was not only allowing it, but following her. And quick side note, the Lady Jezebel, the one we find in 1 Kings 16, she introduced, listen, the worship of statues. Are you following me? She introduced the false worship of statues. As a matter of fact, she, she um, you know what, let me not say she introduced it, but she definitely ran with it. And so, of course, it was an income that would come into the, to the, to the thing because she produced statutes and people would buy statutes and bow down to a wooden statue and pray to a wooden statue who was made by human hands. Think about how crazy that is. But this is what that woman began. Remember we talked about idolatry and how God hates it? And so this is what was happening. So listen to what he says, verse 21. God says, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She was bringing that into the church. And she did not repent. See, the problem with Jezebel was she was rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, calling her to repent. It wasn't so much that she had dropped the ball, because who doesn't? It wasn't so much that she was doing such a wrong, because really, who doesn't? Or who hasn't? It was that she wasn't repenting. And I gave her time to repent over her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Notice that God gives time to repent. Notice that God gives time to repent. Notice that God gives time to repent. And one must always take advantage of that time because that time does come to an end. There is a time when God says, done. Done. There's, there's a price to pay. And this is important, family, because as we continue to do life and as we continue to want to mature and grow in Him and for Him because of Him, We need to understand that if somehow we do something wrong, we need to repent. Because there is, listen, remember, seed time and harvest. There's seed time and harvest. I want to share this principle with you. I've shared it with you before, but it's important that I share it with you again. It's the, it's the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to get. Listen to what Galatians 6, 7 says. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. People will reap exactly what they sow. So, you are going to reap, you are going to receive the same seed you sow. If you plant an apple seed, you will get an apple tree. Say amen if you're with me, family. I need, to throw the, I need to remind you. Listen, God is not punishing you. The punishment already happened 2,000 years ago with Jesus on the cross. But because we are in this earth and because we are subject to the laws of this earth, gravity, um, all those other laws that exist, but the law of God is seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. So it's important that we would know and understand what we are planting in our lives. If we're planting seeds of deceit, then what we're going to get back is we're going to get deceit back. Whatever we plant, that which we will get. So I gave you the negative, but let me give you the positive, because that's what the Lord would want. It's not so much don't. That's not God's word to you is it's do say amen if you're with me God will tell you first do love me instead of don't go that way and fall out of love with me I pray you're getting this God's always thing is to you do do come on man do with me much more than don't it's do 
And so, on the positive note, man, when we are planting the good seed financially, emotionally, spiritually, with our mouths, good seed, good tree will be produced. Say amen if you're with me, family. Because don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will reap also. Very clearly it tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. So, the first principle when it comes to sowing and reaping, which is God's economy here on earth, it is, you're going to reap exactly what you sow. The second principle that I want you to catch. Second truth. Based on the biblical principle of Galatians 6, your reaping always comes later. Your reaping always comes later. Let me start with the negative, and then let's go to the positive. Sometimes, and we've experienced it, you've experienced it, we will plant seeds of whatever. Fill in the blank. Sometimes out of ignorance, we don't know any better. Sometimes out of just pure, straight up rebellion. Whatever might be the case, we, we, we fill in the blank and we, and we all say yes to it. Your reaping always comes later because sometimes nothing is happening and we think, ah, I'm getting away with it. I don't even think we think we're getting away with it. We just think, whatever, man, it's all good. And then, but dang, there it is, sowing and reaping. All of a sudden you open the door and there's that big old withered tree looking super ugly wrapping its branches around you with thorns. Say amen if you're with me. You know what's up, because we've all been through it. But let me give you a word of encouragement also. Your reaping always comes later. Listen, we've been praying for those loved ones for how many years? <laughs> Don't give up. Let's continue to sow that seed. We come here on Wednesdays. We pray, and the 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 the, the the energy that's, that's audible is shot into the air and we think, if we didn't know any better, we think, pfft, noise. But God is listening. And He's taking care of business. And He's preparing, listen, and He's preparing the situation for you to get there and walk through. And so the reaping always comes later. So let's continue the good fight of faith. Amen? Because I'm telling you that the reaping, it's going to come. The tree is going to be. Bottom line. And God says it. He says, there's nothing that you have given that won't be given back to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when we give, He gives back to us, listen, 40, 60, 100 fold. Did you hear that? Let's, let's, just, let's just talk financially. I give the Lord a dollar as if the Lord was broke. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? The tithe is mine because you're broke? Seriously? No, for you, dummy. It's because I want to get you to stop idolizing money. I want to get you to understand that that's the least on the hierarchy of, 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 of heaven, that's like the least. If you can't be faithful with that, you can be faithful, can't be faithful with anything. But God says, I give him a dollar, it's going to come back to me 40, 60, or 100 fold. You tell me what stock can give you that. <laughs> you tell me what bond can give you that. You want to get rich quick? Scheme, give to the Lord. You're going to get it back 40, 60, 100 fold. Please don't think that we need money here. Just in case you're, there's any confusion. Don't think that. Where God guides, God provides. I often spur people to give because I want them to prosper. I don't prosper with you giving. I prosper with me giving, not you. So I just share that with you so that you stop rubbing two pennies together. You want to be a little more financially secure? 
watch, give. For it is in fact more blessed to give than to receive. I just gave you the financial aspect of it. But there's many more to it. Darius and I, and, 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 and I encourage you guys always pray. Be in prayer. I'll text you. Pray. Please pray. I tell Darius, let's go. Get over here. Put, let's, let, put the computer down. Let me turn up. Let's pray. Let's pray because this is the seed that we want to sow. It doesn't come naturally. I want to sit there with my feet up watching the game and, 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 and then watch the one after that. And then watch the highlights of the two that I just watched. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? All the males know what I'm talking about. But it's, okay, we're going to do that still, but let's pray. Because we want to sow that seed. Because when I pray, guess what happens? The Lord stirs other people to pray for us. You're going to plant, you're going to sow, you're going to reap that which you sow. Second principle, your reaping always comes later. So don't grow despondent, don't grow discouraged. It's going to happen, man. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Say amen if you're with me, family. Third principle that I want you to focus in on as we close up shop. You are always going to reap more than you sow. When you plant a seed, you get a tree. When you sow to the wind, the Bible says you reap a whirlwind. When you sow to the flesh, when you plant disobedience, you reap death. And in the process, on the good note, you're going to always reap that more than what you, what you planted. On the good note. Amen, family? Amen. Important. Important for us to understand that. Let's close up shop. So verse 22. <coughs> Indeed, I will cast her, meaning that woman Jezebel, who wasn't really her name, it was just her character, into a sickbed. Remember, she was committing, she was seducing them to commit sexual immorality. God says, you like beds, you little floozy? I'm going to put, put you in a bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, notice, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Again, the plea to repent. Please repent, God says. Notice verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. You remember? The eyes like a flame of fire. And what about I will kill her children? Before you start getting all offended, right? That means the ones that are being taught by this woman. Say amen if you're with me. Those are the ones that he's talking about. The ones that are being taught by this woman. I'm going to kill your children with death. <laughs> what do you mean with death? Of course you're going to kill with death, right? But he's talking about the second death. We've talked about that. We're all going to experience the first death. This, phys this physical body will, body will come to an end. But many are going to experience yet another death, which is the second death. The second death is the separation from God um, for all eternity. That is what death is, is, is at the end of the day. And again, I remind you that the, that the first death, um, it's going to happen to all of us, but the second death is optional. The second death is optional. Everyone's going to spend either eternity in the presence of the Lord, fulfilling your responsibilities, whatever that might be, which are going to be, um, your responsibilities in heaven are going to be based on the character that God gave you here on this earth and your faithfulness here on this earth. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Right. So, um, you've been faithful in the little. Enter into more. God says. So, you know, our responsibilities there, it will be dependent on our faithfulness here. Saved in His presence, but we're going to have responsibilities. We're not going to be sitting there playing the harp uh, with the little, like the angels. Important that I say that because we have this view of that, and that's not the way it's going to be. Verse 24, now I say to you, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. In other words, for those of you that are not following Jezebel and that are not being seduced by her, for those of you who have not known the depths of Satan, notice it was idolatry stirred by Satan, 
as they say, verse 24, I will put on you no other burden. In other words, I have nothing else for you. You're doing a great job. It's just them that I got a problem with. And them I want to repent. But to you who are not following this nonsense, to you I have nothing to say to you. But this, look at verse 25. Hold fast what you have till I come. Don't turn, man. Stay focused. Some of you don't have this doctrine. Keep it like that. Verse 26. Here's the eternal motivation. Remember I told you about that? Remember you know about that. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Remember that this Jezebel, she seduced and killed and murdered for land and power. You remember that? 1 Kings 16. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Stick with me. Don't, don't, don't tune me out. We're almost done. Important. So, she, so he says to us, hey, don't follow that doctrine. Stay focused, and I'm going to give you land. And I will give you power over the nations. How exactly that's going to transfer out, I don't know. But it goes along with what I told you, that we are going to be given responsibilities. And it's going to be based on our faithfulness. It's as simple as that. And it's not going to be based on whether you're a pastor or whether you're a woman. How faithful have you been with that which has been entrusted to you? Period. That's it. Verse 27, He shall rule over them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. As I also have received from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen? Amen. Family, we're going to close like this. My prayer for you, and I'm not going to pray, I'm praying as I speak to you. My prayer for you is that the Lord would give us wisdom. May God help us to continue to stay focused on Jesus. And may God give us, listen, here's the key, the grace to keep it simple. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Let's keep it simple, man. Who is he? He's a good, good father, man. Who am I? I'm loved, forgiven, and accepted. That's it. Everything else, it comes. But I don't need to stress and worry too, too much. Da, 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 da. I'm forgiven. I'm loved and I'm accepted. That's it. Amen, family? Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord shine His face upon you and continue to grant you peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.